good. Well, it's wonderful to see you guys again. Um, let's see. Let me get my PowerPoint here. Remember how to share a screen. Good. Um, we just have a, we're just, my, my intention here is to just finish up chapter two. Um, and then hopefully uh, we can take more uh, a leaps and bounds approach rather than uh, baby steps going slowly through each uh, object. But I hope that this uh, foundational discussion um, on some of these fundamental uh, epistemological and metaphysical topics uh, will be helpful because I think they're, I think they are essential for kind of understanding how Father Peter uses uh, the tradition, uses the language and the concepts and metaphysics in the tradition to articulate how he's receiving uh, St. Maximilian and how he understands uh, St. Maximilian himself to fit into uh, the tradition. So um, hopefully this is useful for you. Let me, let me just try to share a screen here. I guess you can see that. Let's see if I make this large. Okay, can you guys see that? Yeah. Yes. Good. Um, okay. I'm not sure exactly where we left off last uh, two weeks ago. Um, so I, but I think we can get through this. I have. Mm. I have too many pages on this slide uh, to get through, so we'll pretend we are, we're going to get through this. Um, can we open up with a word of prayer? Maybe uh, F Father Deacon can do this, can lead us. For us a choice. Go ahead. Hello, the love, grace the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us, sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Holy feet of wisdom, pray for us. Pray for us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Oh, you have to edit that out. That was a little bit of a slurp. Um, Let's see here. Okay, so basically, I think at the end, and people can uh, say yes or no, we got to really the issue of the critical question, we began discussing it. Um, and uh, a, a key difference is, or a key issue that arises in modern theology, that really has its roots, I think, in the, in the distinction between the image and the brute. Uh, namely the image of God, that which was created, the created person in the image of God, and those created realities that are not the image of God. There's something, there's something about being a created person that is a finite uh, center of knowledge uh, and rationality, namely will, and not being that. So there's the issue of finitude on the one hand, which makes us not God, and so the the criteria or criterion of our knowledge and our judgment cannot be ourselves. And really, there are problems that arise in terms of judgment when one considers ourselves and our surroundings um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, that flows right out of this, even though we have certain limitations with respect to knowledge and judgment, there also is the fact that we're not sub-rational. So we don't we don't operate by um, instinct or a kind of reason that is um, lower than personal. Uh, personal meaning uh, that which bespeaks autonomy and the ability to um, perceive the good as good and and love the the good as good or perceive being as being love um, the good as good. And so there's this reflexive uh, type of and uh, type of structure to our knowing and there's a self-directedness to our knowing. And so this raises the question of how do we justify or how do we understand our relationship to the objects we know, both in, well, in terms of their source, in terms of their um, 
coming to be in terms of objects of knowledge, as well as in terms of their purpose, how they fit into the larger scheme of things with respect to the order of creation, the order of society, the order of ourselves with respect to creation, society, and ultimately God. So um, there is, I think, for the Franciscan school, uh, inherent a critical question, um, something that Kant especially recognizes. And <clears throat> Basically, the, the critical question boils down to then, um, how do we explain the reality of personal judgment? This is kind of uh, where the issue comes into play. And for St. Bonaventure in, in, in SCOTUS, in a kind of moment of agreement with Kant, they do recognize that there is a critical, critical question, meaning how do we make judgments? Because crisis, crisis uh, is the word for judgment. And a key notion in St. Bonaventure is the very notion of rationality or ratio or proportion uh, indicates judgment or comparison. So there's a comparison between the object represented in my understanding and the object in reality. Um, and also there must be then a third comparison according to St. Bonaventure as the object is eternally exemplifying in the divine mind. And so there, there is this notion of judgment, this comparison. Why? Well, because we're not ontologically identical to our objects of knowledge, nor because we're finite, um, are we the ground of our own knowledge. And Bonaventure will go on to say that even the faculties of senses in their relation to uh, external objects of knowledge or even internal states don't admit of a kind of self grounding, even if there is with respect to in internal states, like I know I'm, I know I'm thinking um, right now, I know I'm speaking, there is a kind of self evidence. There still isn't in that very self evidence of myself as a contingent being discerning and realizing my own actions and intuiting my own states and mentally, there isn't, there isn't a, <clears throat> a grounding ontologically ultimately for why that state or this reality should 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 exist, and so this is where Saint Bonaventure recognizes the critical question. Um, <clears throat> Kant also recognizes the crit critical question, and it's asking many of the same, or it has raising many of the same concerns. Um, and but I think um, this is where this is where uh, Bonaventure, already in the 13th century and then later Scotus, will provide solutions that are addressing some of the same concerns of Kant and later modern philosophy, whether or not it goes full um, phenomenological and existential with figures like in different ways Husserl or Heidegger, or if it takes a more historical or historicizing term, turn <clears throat> with uh, figures like um, Hegel and later uh, historicist theologians and philosophers. Um, Father Peter discusses some of these figures uh, at length. In, in, in several works. <clears throat> if you want to, uh, just as an aside, if you want to look more deeply into that, you could get a, a hold of his writings on, in two areas. One is his writing on Karl Rahner and the Trinity. And the other one is where he interacts with, uh, especially uh, uh, Bruno Forte, uh, also uh, Walter Casper in his article, uh, neo Patropassianism from a Scotistic Viewpoint. Uh, this is where he's dealing with more historicist uh, theologies. And I think both the, the um, phenomenological existentialist uh, approach to philosophy and theology, what, one that you might discover uh, ultimately in a figure like Karl Rahner or uh, Bernard Lonergan, um, or the more historicist approach that is kind of represented by a figure like Bruno Forte. Both of these are <clears throat> coming out of attempts to deal with the critical question. But they come out of attempts to deal with the critical question in a certain manner. And I think this is, this is the, the key insight and contribution of the Franciscan system. And so let me take a couple uh, step back, steps back. <clears throat> So basically for uh, Descartes and later Kant, and especially Kant, because he brought this discussion into a more scientific and <clears throat> universal presentation. Um, for, for Kant and Descartes, the, the critical question, that which 
that question which deals with the, the problem of knowledge with respect to criteria for evaluating or establishing that knowledge as, as both adequate and in ways necessary, necessarily true, uh, and thus giving a rise to the reality of, of certitude, intellectual certitude. How do you, how do you justify this? <clears throat> well, for both Descartes and Kant, in, in common, there's a certain kind of methodological doubt in what we might call the trust in our faculties, either our faculties of sensation, especially with Kant, or even our faculties of knowing with, with I mean, excuse me, our faculties of sensation with Descartes and our faculties of knowing with, with uh, Kant. And the trust here that we're dealing with is <clears throat> analyzing, it's, it's basically asking the question, how do we get out of being a subject, engaging in the very subjective, subjective act of trying to discern or establish criteria for the certitude and reality and scope of subjective knowledge. How do we deal with this issue, this relationship between subject, the knowing individual and object, that which is known, whether externally, objects of sensation, internally, states of mind, or metaphysically, um, unchangeable truths that are uh, above time and change. And so this is this is uh, the question. They 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 pose the the question of criteria for knowledge, judgment, the critical question in terms of what they what they speak of in, as trust in the faculties. How do we how do we arrive at a state where we can justify this trust in our knowing faculties? Well, for Kant, and this is very important, Kant says there really is no way to justify this. And so he makes really two moves. One, he says, since there is no way to justify on the basis of how we know, what we know, we must then discern a distinction or draw a distinction in adjudicating or addressing this critical question between that which is perceivable immediately and directly and that which is not. So you have, you have what are called the phenomenon or and the Noumenon. Now, the phenomenon. This is stuff that is directly perceivable, and what we this is this is the stuff of experience, like sense experience, internal states, judgments about uh, reality, both um, scientific and ethical, which then uh, pertains to society, um, economics, all all of these all of these aspects. The the noumenal are those things which Kant would say are the Platonists or the Aristotelians would call the things in themselves, like the essence and <clears throat> the whatness. Do we have direct access or can we indirectly, can we adequately is the question, make judgments about the essential nature of any kind of thing or any states of a, state of affairs? And Kant's understanding is that Really, we don't have direct access to this. But we need to act like we have direct access to this. Otherwise, even our, our organization and activities based upon what are called phenomena, those things which are accessible, the appearances of things rather than the thing in itself, even those actions or judgments would be utterly incoherent. There'd be no way to organize or unify this experience at our activity and our understanding of the world in any kind of scientific manner. And he says, he thinks that ultimately then, what you need is what you need to establish is a science of organizing um, agency and ethics that recognizes that we do not have direct access to things in themselves. And this is important because essentially what Kant is, is recognizing, or at least he's asserting, is a similar kind of problem that St. Bonaventure came up with, or it recognized in his disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, especially question four. Um, and that, that is, to, uh, to summarize, is our sources, means, and ends, the very process and product of knowledge is finite 
and mutable. This is essentially the problem in a nutshell. So how do you arrive at a knowledge of immutable things in themselves through and from a process that is inherently contingent and mutable and finite, limited? Um, <clears throat> Bonaventure recognizes the same problem. Kant says, well, you, you really can't. And so metaphysics in that sense, Kant in a sense uh, oversaw as, as uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Alex Plato, at uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville says, Kant presided at the divorce of faith and reason because Kant already understood that there could not be a unification, a unified understanding of um, the phenomenal and the noumenal, the scientific and the metaphysic. And so what he said then is we have to model our philosophy in terms of a scientific approach, but that scientific approach already precludes then metaphysical knowledge, metaphysical insight, right? And if you preclude metaphysical insight, because God is that which is beyond change, beyond the physical, by definition, then you also have to exclude theology as an area of rational inquiry and discipline. And so Kant's intent, in a sense, was recognizing that metaphysics is impossible Yet we need to preserve religion, a space for religion, and recognize that it can't be modeled on the scientific that is only based on the phenomena and uh, things that can be measured or perceived. He said, well, he wants to protect us, give it, provide a space for religion, but this religion was in a sense evacuated of its ontological content, meaning we don't have access even through our concepts, even if we have, even if we lack direct access or insight into God in himself, our concepts and our metaphysical categories and distinctions don't allow us to have insight into what God is, either indirectly or directly, indirectly through inference, directly through um, especially states of infused contemplation. That, that's just simply impossible. So the very notions then of um, a real revelation is ruled out. Uh, the notion of an incarnation in the Chalcedonian Orthodox sense becomes impossible because how can you unite or how could you ever know that was united or uh, divinity and humanity in a supernatural hypostasis? How could this even be re revealed? And if it um, or how could this be possible? Uh, but if it were possible, how could we ever know it? Because we have no access into it. And so what, what Kant then advocated was the formulation of science in terms of general categories. Now, these, many of these general categories he pulled right from Suarez, who was following the, the general tradition of Thomas, Scotus, Aristotle. But he understood these categories as more of um, unprovable and um, non-evident non-directly evident, pragmatic postulates for activity. He says, basically, if we don't have these, these categories, there will be no coherency, especially in the realm of ethics, in human action. So we need these categories, like uh, the first basic um, moral category, categorical imperative is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Essentially, that's what it boils down to. Now, um, what this, in effect, created though was it created a, created a kind of ceiling over human intellect such that the human intellect can only aspire so high and can't get get through there's there's a, an invisible wall or ceiling and then <clears throat> metaphysical truths and supernatural revealed truths can't get in and so you have a radically secularized intellect meaning both the ideological sense that it's secular insofar as there it, it is convinced that there is no um, revelation and there are no metaphysical truths that are true at all places and all, at all, all times, but also a radically secular intellect insofar as it's always of the age. So it falls under that kind of Chestertonian um, uh, uh, anathema that, you know, the, 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 the fads of the age are what, what will end up dictating the beliefs and activities of a radically secularized inter intellectual because clearly all thought is modeled on science and then you have a certain class of individuals scientists well they'll be the experts 
in uh, human thought and activity, and we must trust them. And so how do we adjudicate scientific uh, knowledge or claims? Well, that becomes more difficult. It becomes kind of uh, um, a repristination of a certain kind of elitism or uh, a Gnostic reality wherein the scientists have the scientific mindset and the rest of us, the secularized intellect, will be trusting the wisdom of the scientists. Why? Because they're scientists and they've developed a scientific approach to um, not an inquiry and knowledge. And so what happens then is if you want to preserve um, faith, you you have to side on the, 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 the side of fideism. There's a radical will to believe and this will to believe can be explained by many, many forces, um, social pressures, family tradition, um, a felt need in someone like uh, Schleiermacher, uh, a feeling of absence. But none of these, none of these uh, drives, according to Kant, actually justify the content, what's being asserted as true in religion. Why? Well, simply because in principle, religion is um, unattainable. It's, 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 you can't, you can't establish this according to Kant because simply you don't have access to the things in themselves, even on the natural level, we don't have access to knowledge of what a dog is or what a person is. And therefore we certainly can't have knowledge of metaphysical truths. And clearly God is the most personal and as most personal, most metaphysical being there is. So if we're going to have faith, it's not going to be rooted in this orientation or or completion or um, marriage between reason and faith, knowledge and love, that, that that's not possible. So there, it's 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 fideism in religion. But on the other hand, then what you have is a complete rationalism. There are no there are no external constraints other than the science based upon the 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 analysis according to a scientific method. Of, of what is the case. So you have a radically secularized intellect. This is what Father Peter is getting at. And this is what he's saying. This is, this is a real critical question because we have the issue again, going back to the beginning of finite persons and contingent knowledge and contingent sources of knowledge. So how do you arrive at something that is necessary, immutable, um, and even eternal as something known and true on the basis of all these uh, temporal, mutable, um, changeable, and um, ultimately unstable uh, realities from within. How do, you, how do you, in a sense, grab your hair and pull yourself up by your hair to a, a, a point of transcendental engagement and recognition? Kant says, well, Kant says it can't be done. Um, and uh, this, this is, you know, kind of the, the central question of uh, the Christian approach uh, that as asserts the reality of metaphysics, recognizes the reality of metaphysics, and then bases their knowledge and way of life on the reality of the incarnation, which is pointing to the reality of the Trinity and a supernatural finality or purpose in creation as such. And so with Kant, then, you have the, the secularization of the intellect and a kind of uh, rationalism, fideism dichotomy when you're dealing with questions of faith and reason. There isn't the, uh, the, the harmony of faith and reason that the Catholic tradition uh, has perennially argued for. Now we'll get to a couple of other things. So, so the, the, the question then for Father Peter looking at this tradition, looking at the reality of Kant, because Father Peter, when he was young, back in the 50s, and then through the, the early part of the 60s, he, he was actually very persuaded, or at least persuadable, by Kantian type arguments. And he was more sympathetic to a transcendental uh, kind of approach, a transcendental Thomist kind of approach, which we may have opportunity to look at, but if you want to get uh, the fuller picture of transcendental Thomism and Father Peter's uh, um, considered opinion, look at his article on Karl Rahner and his article on Neo-Patrapassianism. 
Um, and then he has some other he has some other publications, lengthy studies that are going to be in the final two volumes of his collected essays dealing directly with transcendental Thomism. Um, those need still need to be formatted and edited a bit uh, for reading. But if you want to find out what he thinks about this now or late, later in his life, uh, those two texts are the place to go to. But the interesting thing is, is Kant is very persuasive. Father Peter in uh, certain places calls Kant the Aristotle of our times, baptizing Kant. I think I may have uh, forwarded that paper to some of you. What the point is, though, is that Kant is very persuasive and he has a case to be made. And he's raising the, 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 the critical problem um, is how do, we, how do we adjudicate the, the finitude of, of our, our lives and our experience and our knowledge, um, how, do we, how do we judge or, or justify this, these assertions uh, with respect to um, also the claims of, of supernatural truth and supernatural ends and metaphysical immutable knowledge? How do we do this? So, so Father Peter said Kant is very convincing. He admitted this and Kant has good arguments. The critical question is a real problem. And <clears throat> For Father Peter, then, the issue then to respond to Kant is not primarily to look. It, it's, a, it's a matter of the formulation of the problem. Um, Newman perceptively said, with respect to this initial issue of methodological doubt, this first point under the main heading, um, the issue of methodological doubt is, is misguided and misplaced. There is no justification or the notion of trust or proving one's faculties. One simply uses one's faculties rightly or wrongly. One doesn't trust one's faculties. So when I look out the window and I see a tree or a, a forest, that's not an issue of me trusting that faculty. It's an issue of me using that faculty as a free agent. And so this is the first point. So uh, more fundamental problems are the issues of uh, the principles of science. When I say um, A, equals a the principle of identity a dog is a dog a tree is a tree when i recognize this principle it's not a matter of me trusting my faculties in the formulation it's a matter of me using my faculties and recognizing this well for uh Kant and descartes it was a matter of trust and then justification how do we trust and justify or justify our trust of our faculties and this is ultimately they said it, can't, it cannot be done in a robust and thoroughizing way. This is why they posited the model of science and uh, a radical kind of autonomy or secularization of the intellect and thus a divorce between physics or knowledge of the material world and knowledge of the immaterial world, physics and metaphysics on the one hand, and thus also reason and revelation or reason and faith, the natural and the supernatural. It was, a, it was an, an inevitable outcome, but this was, this was, and it was rooted in a real problem. It's the real problem of finite personhood, finite personhood with a certain measure of self, um, well, a, cer a certain measure of self-direction. And the mystery of how do we make judgments about, about the truth of things and the truth of the states of affairs. For, for, for Kant, because of these limitations, he said this can't be done in a, in a way that justifies metaphysics or religion. For, for um, <clears throat> Father Peter and the Franciscans, he said, well, wait a second. For, and Newman is here along this line too, is wait a second, there, there, there is the fact of certainty. There is the fact of personhood. There is the fact of the distinction between personal being, immaterial being, and material being. All of these things are evident. And so the issue is not to deny the evidence or to try to explain away the evidence. The issue is to accept the evidence and say, yes, I recognize in my own activities of reflecting upon my own actions that there's a distinction between a spiritual act and a physical act. And because you cannot have any causes or any effects, excuse me, without a certain cause, the principle of sufficient reason, which is another uh, one of those fundamental principles of science. For every effect, there must be an adequate cause to explain that effect. This is just something known intuitively. Um, <clears throat> and as soon as we speak it, we recognize the truth of the matter. Um, because we recognize these realities, getting back to St. Bonaventure and Scotus, it's not an issue then of trying to 
adjudicate or justify rather the truth of, of these realities we experience. Because these are, this is reality for us. Existing as finite persons with finite, contingent, mutable sources of knowledge, but yet arriving at rock solid certainty. Now, for, for Kant, this would be a fiction. But for Bonaventure and Scotus, because they already had the eyes of faith and they, they believed in Christ being the teacher, revealing the Father, who is anything but mutable, read James chapter one, they, they knew that the, the certainty that we arrive at is not something that is merely accidental or epiphenomenal, phenomenal, something totally inexplicable. They said, no, no, this is something that's reality. We're, we're not having an issue here with the trustworthiness of senses, our sense knowledge, the, the adequate operation of our intellectual faculties like memory, intellect, and will, the process of abstraction, the, 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 the process of composition and division, the process of discursive reasoning, what Aristotle calls the three internal acts of the mind. For, for Bonaventure, it was a recognition of the same kind of critical question, but rooted not in the justification of the trust in faculties, but rooted in an explanation of how we can make these judgments de judicatio, how we can how we can recognize a ratio or a reason which has a connotation both for how do we recognize what kind of thing something is what is the nature of the state of affairs but more importantly a ratio is a proportion it's a comparison between two things and this kind of comparative activity happens at every level of our thought we compare uh two is to four right? As eight is to 16, there's a, there's a proportion there. Um, <clears throat> the, the teacher in the classroom is like the captain at a ship. There's a certain proportion there, right? Um, there, my idea, here we go. My idea is like the thing I'm perceiving, like the reality outside of my mind. So the issue for Bonaventure is not justifying these processes. He says all these processes are evidently true. They're not something that can be uh, denied in, in, a, in a global sense. There, there can be obviously problems with uh, faulty sensation, uh, hasty judgment about sensory perception, that sort of thing. Uh, but what he's saying is globally, these things have to be taken. They're just evident. But the issue is then is how do we understand the evidentness and certainty of our knowledge based upon individual judgments? Again, these judgments actually happen in the second act of the mind. Um, after abstraction, you have composition and division. The third act is discursive reasoning. Well, that second act includes composition and division, but that very action of composition, putting things together in comparison or distinguishing two things. You know, if I put two things together in comparison, I say, oh, man and dog, both animal, right? But if I, if I, if I divide them, I say, man and dog, man rational, animal irrational. So there's a division, but I'm making comparative judgments and I'm bringing things into relation or distinguish them, distinguishing uh, them in relation on basis of certain criteria, the recognition of sameness and difference, fittingness and unfittingness, congruity, incongruity. Um, <clears throat> and so this also then results in a judgment. This is what Bonaventure calls de judicatio. And this is for Bonaventure the, the key mystery of the intellect, intellective component of human activity. How do we make judgments like this that arrive at certainty? Because our judgments, again, are based upon finite and contingent knowledge, a finite and contingent action of knowledge, and all of this flows out of a finite and contingent person acting. And so Bonaventure says, well, we know all of this is true. And we know that there is a problem in justifying all of this on the basis of the very sources. It's all finite and contingent. And so for him, though, he says, well, we can't, we can't do away with certainty. This is a fact. We know this. So how do we understand certainty? And this is where he develops his doctrine following St. Augustine of uh, divine illumination. Now, divine illumination here is trying to answer the question, not of how do we explain a trust in our faculties, but how do we explain ourselves as finite uh, agents with our own um, 
relative or limited personal autonomy? How do we explain the, the, the reality of finite personhood? And so Bonaventure wants to say in the first act then, in the, in the very being of a finite person, this entails a unique way that God cooperates with his creature in what um, the scholastics call the divinus concursus, the divine um, co-running, the continuous created, creative activity. So in being constituted as a person, that very act of constitution as a person is essentially different than a subpersonal being, whether sentient, vegetative, whether, whether an animal, a plant, or just a, a, a concatenation or combination of elements like rocks and, and things like that, water. There's an essential difference. So God interacts and, and his act of creation is different with respect to a person. And this reality of personhood, even in the finite order, is uh, of, of a kind of infinite dif distance within parentheses from other created entities. So the person is categorically different than the non-personal being. How do we explain this difference? Well, we recognize it, but how do we explain it? Well, Bonaventure says in that first act of creating, God, in a sense, in giving us mind, memory, intellect, will, but especially intellect, um, my, in, in that first act of creating us, he creates us, I like to use this metaphor, with the lights on. And this is what is called divine illumination. There's all, you're already created in the very first act of your being before you even have a thought as a rational being with, with, with the light of reason, with the light of being itself in your mind. This is, this is the relationship, this light of being between you as a finite person and God as an infinite creating person. And this is essentially different. This is a transcendental relation of being. It's not a categorical relation, meaning it doesn't fit within the... Categories of Aristotle like substance and all the accidents. No, this is what constitutes you as directly dependent upon the creative act of God. So Bonaventure says, God creates us with the lights on. And by virtue of this light of being, all those acts and interact interactions between sensation and um, abstraction, judgment, and discursive reasoning, all of these interactions flow out of this primordial relation between God and the creature and this unique way that God continues to hold into being personal creatures versus impersonal creatures. It's all divine concursus because it's all creation. It's all caused by God if you want to be more abstract and philosophical about it. But it's, but it's in different modes. It terminates in different activities. God's mode of terminating in his creative or causal activity with respect to a, a rational creature is to create them in a, in a sense, with the light of reason already on. And Scotus would simply call this, Bonaventure calls this the fontal object of knowledge, this knowledge of, of reason itself, this reality of the light of reason. That, that fontal object is this divine illumination that constitutes us in our very being as rational. This is distinct from what Bonaventure would call the motive object. And the motive object are the individual items of knowledge that we come to through introspection and through sense experience, experiencing the world around us. This is called, these are called, these different aspects are called motive objects. So I pick up this book and I say, oh, I have, I have now an instance, a motive for a certain type of knowledge, a knowledge uh, of bookness. And this is brought into relationship with all of the other instances of my interaction with books and with other items. And so now I can make a judgment. Oh, this is this is a book. I've seen this before, that sort of thing. Memory and intellect, judgment, will. I can pick this book up. Um, <clears throat> these are all motive objects, but these are not what constitute rationality as created and finite as such. There has to be another explanation. But Bonaventure says, because I can do this, I can know this is a book, and I know that I'm knowing this is a book, there must be something more fundamental, because again, an effect can't exceed a cause. And he says, this is the reality of personhood. And the reality of personhood here that we experience is limited. It's imperfect. But what explains an imperfect person? Well, a more perfect cause, creating that. And this is what he means by divine illumination. We're uniquely created with the light of reason. This, this, is, this is the fontal object, the source that comes from God. It's not a kind of supernatural grace, and it's not an occasional engagement 
with God zapping like Zeus from heaven, lightning bolts of insight into our mind. No, this is how we're structured. This is our very mode of being. Just as God continuously creates a tree to be a tree, and he's always continuing, he's always concursing or acting to create that tree as tree to hold that in being so also he holds us in being as rational agents there's nothing with respect to uh what we call the mode of grace or supernatural yet at issue but there is a relatively supernatural relationship of the person with respect to the non-person in creation because a person is infinitely different than a than a non-person this is the point bonaventure is making and he says in order to explain this difference between personal being and impersonal being coupled with the reality that we are persons and do have knowledge, and we even arrive at certainty through judgment, there must be an explanation. And this is divine illumination. This is a unique relation of God creating the person in a certain way. Um, so this is, this is a very biblical metaphor that Bonaventure uses, rooted in the tradition, both East and West, uh, especially Augustine, but also you find the tradition in later Polemite theologians uh, used to a different effect. Um, <clears throat> St. Maximus the Confessor, this is almost also important for. And I think the language is, is, is helpful because it gives us a picture that is very in very close um, conformity with uh, the scriptures, especially the Psalms and, and the Gospel of John, for example. In your light alone do we see light. You know, show us the light of your face, the, the light of your countenance. Um, the, Jesus is the light that enlightens every man that comes into the world. I am the light of the world. All of these things. This is why Christ, the Bonaventure can say Christ is the one teacher, but he will make distinctions. Christ in, in his mode as, as the word eternal is the exemplar of all created realities. In the word incarnate, the unifier, mediator, and perfecter of created realities. And in the word inspired, this is then how supernatural grace operates in the life of the believer. And there's a, 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 an elevation or a hierarchization of the way that someone lives in grace as distinct from merely being a person. Persons are created to be in grace, but by the very act of creation, they're not in grace. They're actually in Adam and they need to be recreated through baptism in faith in Christ through the mediation of Mary. So the, the point here is that I'm getting to is that for St. Bonaventure and Scotus, the issue is, how do we explain? And this is, and Father Peter formulates this on the basis of a great book, is how do we explain the love of learning, this, I, this desire to know, also with this, with this inbuilt desire for God, because God, God created us to know him. So the, the question then is the relationship in the academic mode of critical discernment, what Kant is so concerned with, and the drive for sanctification. And he says, you really can't separate the two because once you recognize that you are a finite person dependent upon God, that very light of being forces you to seek that source. And in, in seeking that source truly, you're going to also begin uh, through actual grace and also perfect through sanctifying grace, this aspect of the sanctification of the intellect, but the intellect in being sanctified through the, 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 the grace of the Holy Spirit and the will. So in, in the process of critical discernment, if one recognizes the divine light, what Scotus will call the, the, the univocal concept of being, um, then there's going to be inherent in a drive for the source. So um, <clears throat> Bonaventure will then say then, so this is, this is, this is the critical question how do you how do you explain finite personhood and uh, infinite truth? You know, temporal realities and eternal truths, contingent, changeable realities and uh, necessary truths. Um, <clears throat> so how do we explain this? Well, he posits divine illumination. Uh, so when we get to abstraction and judgment of human knowledge, divine illumination helps us uh, understand this because we make judgments in that light of divine illumination, and there's a certain kind of um, <clears throat> touching or reaching um, exemplary causes as controlling and governing those concepts in our mind. There's a certain kind of resemblance, a one-to-one -one resemblance of the eternal exemplar in the mind of God of say, uh, this computer and my experience of this computer. There's, 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 there's an analogy in the mode of being because God's idea is really identical to his being and my idea is just an accident of my mind, but there is an objective conformity. 
And this, it looks an awful lot like what SCOTUS will say. There's a certain uni univocity and concept, but analogy in mode with respect to these concepts. So in abstraction and judgment, there is this comparison, but this comparison is made in virtue of my experience, the object experienced, and the divine light illuminating and governing all of this reality. But because then there's this critical aspect, and this is all that Kant really dealt with, um, Bonaventure says, wait a second, there also is this notion that knowledge itself isn't an end because intellect is a means, it's a middle. It doesn't touch the reality itself. It states something general and abstract about the reality, but this does not achieve the purpose for what our soul uh, strives for. And that's a kind of union in different ways. And so union with the source, the light, is going to take holiness. So how do we understand the function of intellect with respect to will, knowledge with respect to holiness? And he says this, this notion is understood in the concept of wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge passing into affection and or love, and love is that reality that tends us to desire the good for its own sake and desire the good of that good. And so he's, so Bonaventure then says, and here's really where the rub comes in, is that at, in terms of pure abstraction, even in the old covenant, but especially in pagan philosophy, in dealing with knowledge, you're dealing with generalities. Now, in the old covenant, there were concrete instances of God's interaction. But there wasn't the concrete instance of the one teacher who brings heaven to earth literally. And so the mind is stuck still in an instability and unrest, a kind of looking for um, fruition or completion, not just of abstract concepts, generalities, but for a reality, a person, because the mind strives for ultimately union between persons, not community in ideas or causes. And only the Holy Spirit can bring this about. Even on the natural level, there's a kind of spiritual um, fraternity or, or brotherhood. But that's unstable. Why do wars happen, ultimately? Because uh, this, this universal imaging and likeness of God is not recognized. And it's, 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 it ends up being denied <clears throat> for various reasons stemming from sin. Uh, so... What Bonaventure says is that ultimately, if you, if you want to have final rest, a full resolution of abstraction, general generalities into a stability of a mode of life in a relation of my person to other persons, it's going to have to come through a recognition and a relation to that one person. Now, this was all very easy for Bonaventure because he accepted the faith. And so the incarnation of Christ is the answer to this. And the incarnation through the mediation of Mary is the mode of this reality. And so ultimately the resolution is accepting Christ as the one teacher because he, he deals with the abstract, he deals with the concrete in the incarnation, and he deals with the ongoing life of the church internally and individuals in the church internally and externally in the role and mission of the spirit through the sacraments. So he says, ultimately, knowledge is inherently related to and ordered towards wisdom and holiness. But ultimately, this can only be resolved, as Socrates himself said, how do we, how do we, how, how do we learn what prudence is? He says, well, in order to, in order to act prudently, we have to have prudence, right? But in order to have prudence, we have to act prudent, prudently. There's a vicious circle here. We must, we're, we're going to have to, we need somebody divine to come down and teach us. Well, for Bonaventure, and rightly so in reality, Christ is this answer. And so we have to accept then the authority and mediation of persons. Mediation in terms of intercessing between us and the Father, establishing that relationship, repairing that, that breach, but also um, authority in saying, I come from the Father. And uh, with, with Our Lady, I am the term of the creator spirit of the good earth. I'm the, I'm the fulfillment of creation before recreation. I'm the fulfillment of the old covenant precisely because I bring forth the God-man. And so she is in, in a unique relation to the Holy Spirit. 
So there's authority and mediation, the persons of Jesus and Mary in Jesus and Mary in the Holy Spirit. There's an acceptance of Christ and a recognition and acceptance of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so <clears throat> these are these are um, two two approaches, two approaches that recognize the reality of the critical question. There is something going on here. There's the Kantian solution, ultimately, and then there's the Franciscan solution, as Father Peter argues. And Father Peter is arguing that Colby is at least recognizing this implicitly because he was formed and speaking in terms of this very problem. So you have the, you have the issue of critical judgment. What is it? How do we understand knowledge? You have critical judgment or the light of knowledge. You have the Kantian rationalization of knowledge and secularization of the intellect versus the desire for the recognition of sanctification of the intellect. Secularization of san intellect, sanctification. Those are really the two options. And they, they, they're built upon an entirely different perception of the world, but they both recognize the critical issue. Now, <clears throat> um, there's a third point. There's a third or a third option. And this is the Thomistic option. Um, and the Thomistic option here is, is, is rooted, Etienne Gilson said many years ago, that unlike in Immanuel Kant or in St. Bonaventure, Blessed Dunscotus, he says, you, there is no critical problem. There's no critical problem. He says it doesn't exist. And so it's a non-issue. <clears throat> Well, they're, they're, the reasons why he said this is a non-issue is because he accepted fully the philosophical psychology of how we arrive at human knowledge. And this is the basic Aristotelian account, accepted in, in large part by St. Bonaventure, but not as complete, or, say, or, or Blessed Duns Scotus. They say, yeah, this is basically it, but this is incomplete. That's the difference. <clears throat> um, so Aristotle basically held that Knowledge is ultimately a, a, a relation between the intellect and the external world. And this relation is established in several stages. One, there's the senses, the external senses, you know, the five external senses, you know, seeing, tasting, touching, hearing, smelling. I think I got all of them. Feel, yeah, I got it. Um, and then all of these relate or are ordered to the external world. There's a kind of... Uh, pre-established harmony, to use the words of Leibniz, um, between my senses and the external world. So when I see a tree, what happens then is the notion of a sensible species, a kind of sensible information, a connection is made between my senses, my eyes, and that tree. And that connection is made so that my internal senses, these are physical, of, of memory, um, and various other internal, there are four. I, I know I'm feeling silly because I can't remember all of them. Um, <clears throat> but what happens is, is the, the relation is established such that the outside world gets in to the inside physical world through the senses and there's a relationship, there's a line that's created. And then that internal physical world comes up with a general phantasm. It's like a big bundle of information about a certain kind of thing like a tree, you've got a big bundle of tree. And I, this, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this because we could talk all day about it. Um, and then what happens is the, the agent intellect, that active part of the intellect, this is now the spiritual side, we're moved from the physical to the internal physical, the internal physical, the external physical to the internal physical. So we've got a sensible species relationship. My mind, my internal physical, excuse me, is, has a, a species, a phantasm of the external world, like of a tree. So I've got something in here and the, what's called the agent intellect, and this is the spiritual aspect, acts upon within that phantasm, that, that, that idea, that kind of idea, that bundle I have from my sense experience, acts upon that and say, and it pulls out or abstracts, it draws away from this bundle, the essential universal characteristics of tree-ness. So now I have this idea. This is called what this is called the intelligible species. So you've got sensible that are that's physical, sensible species can be sensed, and intelligible is known, intellect, understanding. And that in, in, intelligible species is then what uh, <clears throat> Aristotle says is impressed on what's called the passive intellect. And this is the part that receives reality. 
that it, that receives knowledge. So there's a big relation now between my passive intellect and that external tree, because I've got the intelligible species relation between the <clears throat> passive intellect and the phantasmic bundle. I've got that relationship. And I also have a relationship between the phantasmic bundle and the tree itself through the sensible species. So it's a big line of contact. <clears throat> and this just happens. There's no judgment made about it, about the truth or, or falsity of this. There's no recognition or comparison. Why? Well, because the, the process is entirely passive. And so even the very act of the, the intelligible species being impressed upon the passive intellect is the intellect just receives this. So since this is merely a natural process, there is no critical question, right? Do you, I mean, are you following? There's no critical question by the very nature of knowledge. It's just a natural process and it happens in a way with, with um, rational animals different than, or maybe more advanced than brutes or non-rational animals. So there's no critical question. The problem is though, is <clears throat> what do you do with people who assert there is and recognize one? Do you give them the Aristotelian story that says, well, basically we're just like animals, only we have this process of abstraction. We have a, a broader knowledge. Or do you recognize, no, there's something different. And that, that response has, has determined largely the, the, the structure of, of, of modern philosophy and theology, especially in the Catholic Church. Here I'm talking about the Catholic Church. And so what happens is, <clears throat> is you still have the Franciscan tradition, Bonaventure Scotus, that present a coherent account of the critical question in philosophy and theology, recognizing that as finite persons, we can't explain ourselves. We have revelation to assist us and to stabilize us in this knowledge of faith, <clears throat> and also in the resolve of our will to love. We have Kant saying, well, they're really, this is really impossible because we don't have the kind of access, the kind of scientific aspect access to metaphysical truths that we want. We can't measure metaphysical truths, right? We, I, um, we don't have direct knowledge. And so he says, this is impossible. So you have the Franciscan approach and the Kantian approach. And the Thomistic approach basically then has become because <clears throat> the Thomistic approach, Thomas didn't anticipate the critical problem in the way that St. Bonaventure did. And he didn't structure his anthropology and his theology in the way that Bonaventure and Scotus did. He, he understood it strictly on the model of Aristotelian science as a subalternated science to the theology of God and the blessed. And so you have a direct process of, you know, um, posited information and strict logical deduction. And this models the Aristotelian theory of the mind, philosophical psychology. This is, this fits hand in glove with this. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a valid explanation insofar as you're dealing in the realm of physics. But if you re realize there is metaphysics and there is person transcending physics and natural processes and activities, then you'll say this doesn't work. And so what's in fact happened in the 20th century, especially, is that we haven't returned or recognized, returned to or recognized the integrity of the project and account that St. Bonaventure and Scotus, in a sense, perfecting St. Bonaventure gives by anticipation, both Occam and later Kant. And instead, we've tried to bring together, I mean, the, the most famous theologians have, uh, have instead tried to bring together aspects of either the critical approach of Kant, the transcendental approach of Kant on the one hand, or the historicist response. So you've got Kant or the Hegelian response. And these are the, 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 the emblematic figures are on the transcendental Thomist side, which is basically uh, applying Kantian epistemology and insights of Kantian um, structures to Thomistic understandings of the person. This is Karl Rahner and Bernard Lonergan. And so they have what is called a, a transcendental Thomism. And this is, this is dominant. But what it ends up doing, and you can, Father Peter shows this, is it ends up immanentizing the supernatural. 
because in substance, what the incarnation is, is it's not in John 1.18, the son coming down from the father in a sense, in this metaphysical sense, and taking up human nature, taking up not just human nature, but flesh, fallen flesh, <clears throat> and revealing us, showing us the face of the father. It's more because we, we, we can't deal with these categories. We can't deal with things in themselves anymore. What the incarnation is, is it's a manifestation of what God is in the necessary uh, outpouring of himself eternally in the Trinity, extended ad extra. So what Rahner says is the imminent trinity is the economic trinity, and that's true, because in this sense, personhood and generation in God is just this necessary um, self-donation, this kind of impersonal necessary self-donation that becomes ad extra through creation. And so elements of Hegel come in. And the incarnation itself is one of the reason why Christ was the Son of God, is he fully accepted his identity. And so in that full acceptance of his identity, he fully accepted that supernatural um, origin and orientation to the Father that he always was. And this is what makes him different from us. It's not, in a sense, couched on the distinction between nature and person and the hypostatic union and uh, an incarnation of descent and reascent. It's, it's, it's an analysis based upon a recognition of the imminently supernatural reality of the creature, the created person as such, in fully being open to that supernatural reality. And so <clears throat> this is a very low Christology, um, a kind of almost adoptionist Christology based upon very profound misunderstandings of both, in my opinion, philosophy, and, uh, you, just a failure to avert your attention to the Franciscan and uh, post-Chalcedonian Byzantine tradition on the one hand, and then um, a failure to distinguish adequately and consistently as you find in um, the Cappadocians, but especially uh, the Council of Chalcedon and later rehearsed in both St. John of Damascus and St. Bonaventure repeating St. John of Damascus, that essential distinction between nature and person in order to arrive at the notion of the hypostatic union. This notion of the of, of the hypostatic union becomes very vague, and so in a sense, our divinization is recognizing our and an adopted sonship is recognizing our inherent supernatural orientation and spark of divinity, so to speak. And so, once we fully say yes to these forces, we we're going to become perfected. The difference is that Christ accepted that fullness from the beginning. It wasn't the fact that a divine person took on a human nature. Or if it is, it's explained again in terms of this um, acceptance of the internal uh, exigencies, this, these supernatural existential of, 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 of Rahner. Um, <clears throat> and so this is the reason I talk about this. And you have the, you have the historicist, Hegelian kind of process. God is, the Trinity is history. That's a title of a famous book by Archbishop Bruno Forte. And this is, this is essentially pure Hegelianism. Um, it's a misunderstanding of the Trinity, and it's based upon the notion of uh, a dialectical process of God himself. And God, through Trinity, manifests uh, himself <clears throat> in the Incarnation and return uh, of creation through the operation of the spirit back up into the father. And so it's a pure imminentizing of, of Christianity, but it's, but it's a way of trying to deal with these real problems of what is, what is a created person? What is a finite person? And so two approaches has been to try to mix the unmixable, Thomism and Kantianism, or to reduce or correct Kantianism using the language and narrative of scripture and salvation history to bring Trinity down into an imminent engagement, a kind of true co confusion of the divine and the human through this historical approach, the Trinity as history. The other, so <clears throat> the resolution of the critical problem is still important because on the other hand, you have many Thomists who um, are faithful to St. Thomas, but then the questions remain. How do they respond to Kant? I mean, the classic example is Gilson just saying there's no problem. Well, most people won't accept that. And maybe they're completely wrongheaded for not accepting this, but the fact is, is they won't. And if you have Kant and you have Bonaventure and Scotus 
on very different sides of the issue, both recognizing that it's an issue, it should give one pause to just simply pause against saying that this is not an issue. So, so there, there, there's a problem um, that remains. And so this is what this is what the critical question raises, both philosophically and theologically, in Father Peter's mind and in the mind of uh, Saint Maximilian. <clears throat> so let's. Uh, any questions at this point? It's we're, yep. We're moving along. I hope. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Nope. All right. We'll we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, remember that last uh, point. Yeah, I could, I could oh, a question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, in your description, you talk about the. Um, the massive change that brings the Kantian vision in the uh, on the perception of the mind, I would say. Um, uh, my question is: Is there a destruction of the metaphysic because we change uh, the way we see the mind, the process of the mind? Because after Kant, the metaphysic is going uh, is going destructed, is is going down. So. Is there a res, res, relationship, relationship, sorry, between uh, between uh, metaphysical, metaphysic and uh, the process of the mind that could, uh, should be always um, uh, contemplated together in order to not destroy the the process of the mind. I'm I'm don't I don't know if I'm clear uh, enough, but. That's yeah, I think if, if I understand, and anybody feel free to jump in, um, if I understand what you're saying, I would simply answer the question is yes. The, the mind is fundamentally uh, structured metaphysically because the mind doesn't explain itself and it ultimately doesn't explain um, the results that it experiences. So the mind explains the, re uh, excuse me, um, experiences. We experience through our mind the reality of the external world. We experience the reality of internal states of knowledge. We even experience internal states of certitude. We ex experience the notion of freedom, which implies personhood. We experience all of these, and all of these demand an explanation. We're looking again for a sufficient reason why we should have all this, and we don't want to reduce them, all these, this experience, the irreducibility, what they call the hard problem in the philosophy of mind is the irreducibility and radical unity of consciousness. It's not reducible to anything else, but yet it doesn't explain itself. And so this is the issue here. It's the irreducibility of consciousness. This is what um, judgment is. It's that, it's that inner core, that, that most inner part, which is also the highest part that St. Augustine speaks of, of the soul, is this irreducibility of what conscious personhood is. And we experience it not in its fullness because we come to consciousness. But even if we come to consciousness, that means we must be created as a rational conscious type being, a conscious type yeah. being. And so um, what we're doing here is we're seeking to recognize on the one hand, there is this reality of mind. And mind is irreducible to anything else and it's radically unified, but yet it doesn't explain itself. And so we need an explanation. And this is where Bonaventure says the, the, the aspect of the, the activities of the mind and metaphysics need to be kept always in relation because we can't contemplate the mind without contemplating the source of the mind and the reason and purpose for the mind. And this is where metaphysics and mind are, they must be kept together. And yes, for the Franciscans, Bonaventure and Scotus alike, you can't, can, you can't contemplate mind without being a metaphysician. And insofar as everyone has a mind, every person, and that person is a metaphysician. So that the question could be linked with the, the question of the existence of the soul, soul, soul. Because yeah. if if we say, okay, there is no soul, so soul, soul, sorry. Soul, soul, yeah, that's soul. how you say it. There is no soul. So there is no, there is, it's, it's not if um, the, the question of God is not uh, healthy for us. It's not. Um, is it won't help us. So um, maybe the three questions are linked: the, the existence of personal soul, soul, uh, of per, uh, personal God Trinity, 
and and this um, the process of the mind as uh, the frontal experience of the mind as light yes. of course yeah so that's exactly yeah you've 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 raised that issue and you've made the connection um the i think the uh the itinerarium the itiner the journey of the mind to god mm. it moves from the external to the internal to the above and so the the the, the central point here is that the soul is the mediatory the mediator for each person between the external world and the metaphysical world, but also between the reality of the, the finite sub-personal realm to the personal realm, to the super-personal realm, meaning, namely the divine realm. So if you deny soul, if you deny soul, even if there were a God, if you say there is no rational soul, even if there, there were a God or was a God, no one would be there to know it right no one would be there to ask the question and so yes that's that's an excellent point um any, anybody else how are we doing okay uh, i want to move back to this last point at the bottom is we we arrive at the the issue of abstraction and judgment knowledge and wisdom holiness, and then authority and mediation. Ultimately, this is going to only going, we're only going to achieve rest, not in abstractions, but in concrete authorities. This, these are the persons of Jesus and Mary. Now, this is, in, this is important because the, the notion of the teaching authority of Christ in every area will come into play with respect to our understanding of the place of Christ in, in creation as a concrete person, but a teacher who teaches us the truths of the created order according to the purposes of the Father. And so there, there is a priority of Christ. Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end, the Alpha and Omega. And so we can talk about philosophy independently of theology and revelation. Sure, the pagans did it. They came to a lot of um, insights. Even Kant came to a lot of insights, and modern science comes to amazing insights. But the problem is, is it, it's all pragmatic. It's all pragmatic, and it's all paradigmatic, meaning it's not stable. It can shift. It works now. Yes, we all recognize this. But why does it work? What's the purpose of its working? Why do, why do I even care as a person with a soul? Why do I even care that it works? Um, these are the questions that can't be asked. And ultimately, that answer and rest, the rest of our heart, is only in and through Christ and Mary in the Holy Spirit. So this is this is important because this will come into then how we understand doctrinal development. So we have the critical question. The critical question <clears throat> has, on the one hand, the issue of personal judgment. But this personal judgment, according to the Franciscan tradition and St. Bonaventure, it becomes an issue precisely because of what? Because of change. And history is one of those elements of change. And so how do we understand the development of history, the development of the meaning of history? How do we even begin to try to make judgments about this? Well, this pertains to both the flow of history, the meaning of history, as well as the notion of the doctrinal, the, the doctrinal development. And here, St. Maximilian, makes a genuine contribution in an area that you wouldn't necessarily expect. You think he's going to be going to make his contributions in the area of Marian devotion, especially his insights into the, the notion of transubstantiation into the Immaculate, um, quasi incarnatus of the Holy Spirit, um, the uh, notion of the uncreated and created Immaculate Conceptions. All of these are stupendous insights. But here he's making another very important insight, and this goes back directly to St. Francis. And this is the heart. This is why uh, St. Francis was told, was called by Christ himself, right? To rebuild my church. How did he do this? Well, Chesterton explains it in his great biography. He said, Chesterton, yes, he had a certain fixation. He had a certain obsession. He was obsessed, though, with a person, not with an idea. He was obsessed with the person of our Lord. And by then, necessary association because of the alliance of the two hearts of Jesus and Mary and the relationship of Mary to the Holy Spirit in the eternal purposes of the Father's plan. 
he had an obsession with Our Lady. This is why Our Lady, Mary, is the, the first minister general of the order, beyond St. Francis even. And so Chesterton points this out. He says, it, it, you have to read Chesterton because he's amazing for his insights. You don't know how he came to them. Um, but he says, St. Francis had an obsession, but it was an obsession with a person, not an idea. And this is where the interplay between the abstract, the general, the common, and the particular, the concrete, and more importantly, the personal come into play. Because doctrinal development, just like scientific development, can happen on an abstract level. But it's always happening in terms of persons and because of persons with authority and agency to act, to act either prudently in an ordered way or imprudently in a disordered way. Okay. And so <clears throat> the, the notion then, and this, this is growing out organically, the notion of doctrinal development has something to do with St. Maximilian's notion of the fixed idea. And this will play directly into his articulation of the two pages of Franciscan history and the unifying cause of the Franciscan order. So he recognizes then, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Um, so uh, importantly, Father Peter points out that the MI, according to all the, the best testimony, grew out of St. Maximilian's meditation on the covenant of the two hearts. How do we understand this? What's the covenant of the two hearts? Well, the covenant of the two hearts is the spiritual espousals the unity in the common will of God in each of their own human wills. It's, 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 it's Mary being the first member of the church, the spiritual bride of the bridegroom. Mary is also a mother, but in this sense, there's a covenant or an alliance of the two hearts. And this is unique. They stand at the forefront of the church. Why? Well, because Mary was redeemed precisely so she could be a divine mother. As divine mother, she's immaculate. So she's immaculate and she's redeemed in a way that is analogous to our redemption, but different. It's, it's, it's analogous insofar as it has to do with sin and, and its effects. And it has to do with the elevation to a supernatural state or mode of living in grace, in the unity, and through the power and under the guidance and operation of the Holy Spirit. But it's different from ours insofar as Mary was never fallen. And she was redeemed to the maximum. She was saved to the maximum. And so there's, there's a unique then. She stands at a place to be uniquely associated with Christ as what Bonaventure calls co-patriarch or co-patriarchs of the church uh, as, as the head and bride spiritually speaking. Um, and this meditation on the covenant of the two hearts is rooted in a reflection, according to Father Peter, again, following uh, and explaining St. Maximilian, the typology of marriage. Marriage in the beginning, when Christ speaks about it in Matthew 19, in the beginning, it was not so, right? Moses gave them a writ of divorce, and Jesus said, in the beginning, it wasn't so. What does he mean by in the beginning? Well, I'm, we're going to get to that. But in the beginning here, I'm just going to, for for uh, to foreshadow a little bit, marriage signified in the beginning the relationship of Christ to his church. Christ and his bride. The covenant of the two hearts is the personal reality in the fullness of this Christ church relationship signified in the first Adam and the new Eve or typified. And so that marriage as type was already looking forward to Christ and Mary, Christ and church as extension of Mary right? Mary's unique role as bride, as distinguished from her role as queen mother, mother. <clears throat> but because, so there's this typological relationship. It grew out of the, 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 the missio immaculate. What are we doing? Well, this is important because what St. Francis, St. Maximilian is meditating upon is how do we, as members of the church, understand the covenant of the two hearts and bring our understanding and this reality within the church and society of this covenant of the two hearts, rooted in the typology of marriage, to bear in the church today. So this has an inherently ecclesiological structure and an inherently pneumatic structure. Well, he's saying Mary and Jesus are the types of how we should understand our relationship between Christ and the church and the sacraments. Well, how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, he moves it back. He says, oh, well, it requires the act of mediation of Mary. Why? Well, because Mary is already, as mother, 
mother of head and members. And so she's already, even prior to the incarnation, although eternally decreed and elected because of the incarnation to be the mother and then first and perfect bride of Christ in the spiritual sense, she is already active as mediator in bringing forth head and members. So this, this unique positive activity of bringing forth head and members is already the, the operating procedural, the, the operational procedures of the Father working through and within the economy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mary is already, she stands at the forefront of the church. She's the perfection of creation and Israel on the one hand, but she's also the dawn. She's also the source of the source of the head and members. So she actively participates. Why? Well, because she's immaculate conception. She's immaculate conception. And because she's immaculate conception, she actively participates and cooperates with the Father and the Holy Spirit in bringing forth the God-man and the entire body. And so she's already active. She's active in the mind of God from the beginning as mother and bride, and she's active in history as mother and then bride. Well, this activity of mother reaches its perfection in her queenship. She's queen. She's queen mother. And she's also the bridal queen. But as queen mother, as we pray in the fifth mystery, fifth glorious, glorious mystery, she, the, 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 the coronation, this coronation corresponds to Christ's kingly ministry, right? But the coronation as queen also means that she has, she possesses. And then thereby, because of this possession, she also is given the right to distribute the, 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 the fruits or effects of the salvation. This is what we mean by mediatrix of all grace. She stands as queen mother, as immaculate mediatrix in the economy of salvation. Now, if Mary is active in bringing forth the head and the members, she's going to be active in the church also, in the members of the church, in bringing forth Christ, as Paul says. He labors, and I labor among you until you bring forth Christ in yourself. So she's working in this active mediatory aspect to in, in the lives of the church as a whole, corporately, but also in the lives of every individual. And it's only through the lives of individuals becoming immaculate, bringing forth Christ under the active mediation, teaching and influence of Mary, that the church corporately is going to be uh, brought to maturity. Not in its constitution, obviously, Christ and Mary as headed members or head and bride they're already, they're, they're already the foretaste of the promise. We know that the church will reach its perfection because Christ and Mary have reached their perfection. They both ascended and they reign. Nevertheless, in each individual, we must bring forth. We must take up that cross. We must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We must, again, labor until we bring forth Christ. Well, this only happens through the active mediation of the mother because in this very act of mothering, we can't take on this mothering aspect unless we're taught and influenced directly and favored by the mother herself. So in bringing forth Christ in our own lives, it requires the active mediation of Mary, um, mediatrix of all graces. <clears throat> so we have to then understand then that the MI has this fixed idea of Mary as immaculate, but immaculate precisely in order to be mediatrix because she is mother. Immaculate mother mediatrix. And what this, what this brings us back to then is understanding the purposes of everything. This, this understanding of Mary then brings us back to the metaphysical realm, the metaphysical realm in the mind and will of God, the Franciscan thesis. Because the Franciscan thesis is what orients this entire process of old creation, old covenant, new creation, new heavens and new earth. <clears throat> it's rooted in and centered upon the Franciscan thesis. So what you have with St. Bonaventure, you say Christ is the end of time, the end of creation, coming in the middle of creation. This is, he's stating historical metaphysical truths. But he never became <clears throat> fully explicit on this issue of the primacy of Christ. And so he never could arrive at the full, robust understanding of the Immaculate Conception. Because if Christ was, was in, uh, predestined or to become incarnate, apart from consideration of sin, that makes the Immaculate Conception imminently possible. Because the Immaculate Conception doesn't require, the incarnation no longer requires actual sin and redemption. And so the Immaculate Conception is possible 
according to Scotus, and it is fully fitting because Christ is the most perfect redeemer and Mary is his mother. Um, and so this brings us back to, and what, what, the, what the, um, the Franciscan thesis on the absolute predestination of Jesus and Mary, as ratified several times now, uh, in a fabulous Deus, the declaration, dog, the bull on the Immaculate Conception, uses this un uno eodemque decreto, in one and the same decree, uh, Jesus and Mary were predestined. This is in the Greek fathers. I'm thinking of St. Andrew of Crete, St. Germanus of Constantinople, St. John of Damascus, all these figures hold to this notion. So it's a, it's, a, it's a common opinion of the best writers East and West. <clears throat> what this Franciscan thesis is, it makes concrete, absolutely concrete in history, the priority and finality of the incarnation. And so everything in creation and in history is for the sake of the incarnation. So development through history also entails a recognition of the truth of the doctrine stemming from the truth of the reality of the incarnation. And so it's, 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 it becomes very concrete again. We're looking at the concrete person of Christ, not general ideas about the flow of history. And so this fixed idea begins in meditation on the covenant of the two hearts and then is rooted through and understood through the typology of Christ and church, which requires the act of mediation of Mary as immaculate mother mediatrix <clears throat> and is founded upon the absolute predestination of Christ through Mary, thus bringing into unity what Bonaventure calls the eternal word, all the ideas of God ex expressing themselves, the exemplary ideas. We're getting back into the divine light, the fontal object of knowledge, the univocity of the univocal concept of being, that, that unique concept this is, this is dealing in the, in the realm of the liminal, the realm of the pivotal, the realm of the mediatory. All these concepts are, are kind of general, and they allow us to speak commonly. But none of these concepts, these general concepts, actually terminate in a concrete, a concrete that also encompasses and fulfills the content of the universal. So the, Hegel spoke of a concrete universal. Well, what we have here in the reality of Christ in the Franciscan thesis and Mary is you have the reality and the um, focalizing, the focal rays, the rays coming together to point to Jesus and Mary as the purpose for creation. And by extension, Christ and the church, Christ and his bride as the purpose for creation. And so these general philosophical questions in the abstract, what you might call generic concepts, what you might call exemplary ideas, what you might call universals, they're all resolved in terms of their source, their, their, their unifying concrete reality, as well as to their finality in the very persons of Jesus and Mary. Because Jesus and Mary fulfill <clears throat> Jesus as a divine person, he encompasses the abstract and the concrete in the very concreteness of his one person, and he's able to unify them in the distinction of his two natures, divine and human. And Mary as the created counterpart in history and in the hierarchy of the covenant, in that unity, that one flesh unity between Christ and his church, Christ the, the God-man and his church, the bride, um, <clears throat> resolve all of these abstracts, stabilize them. It doesn't solve every question. Bonaventure and Scotus never say this. There's always a distinction between science and faith. But nevertheless, as Bonaventure says, all of, all of the disciplines, all of the arts are reducible to theology, which is ultimately a commentary on sacred scripture. Why, why, why something rather than nothing? The great question of Leibniz. Well, they say all of this is explained and brought into uh, a stable rest a peaceful repose in the arms of our Lord and our Lady because precisely of our Lord and our Lady. So all of these things are rendered concrete and immediate and accessible to anyone in faith and love. <clears throat> and so the fixed idea then becomes fixed on what? What's, 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 the, what's the fixed idea for the Franciscan order once you arrive at Duns Scotus? Well, it's the, the blazing perfection and recognition in SCOTUS of A, 
the absolute predestination of Christ, and B, the Immaculate Conception. And both of these are interlinked. They're, they're, it's a reciprocal. It's a package deal. If you affirm the Immaculate Conception, you are going to affirm logically the absolute primacy. And if you affirm the absolute primacy, you're going to have to affirm the decuit or absolute fittingness of the Immaculate Conception. So this became the cause, the Immaculate Conception. So this is the fixed idea. But what I'm trying to show here is Father Peter's arguing and St. Maximilian is pulling out is that the notion of the fixed idea of the Immaculate is recapitulating and bringing forward all of these other aspects of doctrinal development. Because doctrinal development in his, through history is actually being clarified at the beginning in Christ and fulfilled in Christ and then worked out in the church in its in its manifold ramification and fruitions in the history of salvation. And so this notion of doctrinal development, yes, it will continue because history is a process and we're all finite and limited. We don't have we're not infinite. But yet the fixed node, how we the the de judicatio, you know, the abstract judgment through divine illumination, now we have the concrete to make the comparison to, namely Christ. So as the notion of being is that notion, which every other notion is compared to, the persons of Christ and Mary are the persons to which we compare every person and primarily ourselves and all institutions to. They're the absolute gold standard. They're the gold standard that is woven into a golden thread throughout the history of the Franciscan order. So the fixed ideas were rooted in Christ and Mary and everything we say is comparing is compared to the realities of Christ and Mary and what they teach, and by virtue of their continuous active teaching. Now, <clears throat> this active teaching, because Christ is the head, the church is the bride, and this marriage is unbreakable in every sense, and perfect in every sense, sacramentally, well, this, this teaching is going to be preserved in the church, the church where there's an apostolic hierarchy, and there are true sacraments. And thus, there must be true teaching if Christ is God, and he's true to his promises. And so, nevertheless, though, the, the, the church becomes the concrete locus by which and in which and through which we can, through which the Holy Spirit, Christ, and Mary keep teaching and influencing, and also through which we can compare the access to the concrete individuals of Christ and Mary through the sacrament of the Eucharist, through the activity of the Spirit and the other sacraments, and through the infallible teaching, the infallible interpretation, reception, and passing on of the teaching of Christ. Okay, move on to the next slide. So what's being dealt with here is if doctrinal development in the idea of St. John Henry Newman is more about the process and flow of ideas as abstractions, but nevertheless implicating and bringing created persons up into this, and also finite created institutions like the church up into this notion of doctrinal development. What St. Maximilian is, is through the concrete example of the cause of the Immaculate and the irreducible uh, priority of persons. He's saying, yes, you have doctrinal development, but you always have a fixed idea. So Newman was talking in abstractions. You have the general idea of dogmas and you have all the ramifications of dogmas. And what, what Chesterton would say is that, no, we need to go a step further. We don't deny anything that Newman's saying, because Newman is presupposing he's building in, in other places, the priority of conscience, um, the reality of, of, of judgment. Father Peter writes extensively in his lengthy 200-page essay on Newman and Scotus and Dialogue. He brings all of this to bear, and it's a, it's a, it's a work of genius. Um, but what, what St. Maximilian adds to this is the clear understanding that we've already mentioned Chesterton noting about St. Francis himself is is that St. Maximilian and Francis were not obsessed with an idea, a, a generality, a vague notion, an abstraction. They were obsessed with concrete persons. Now, clearly, you only know persons through ideas, but that's that can be taken as in, in one of two senses. Clearly, there's community in, in common no, knowledge and notions, but that community is always for the sake of true relation between persons. And this is, this is realized through love. Love transcends what knowledge can give. And so St. Maximilian and St. Francis knew, and St. Bonaventure knew, that yes, we have dogma. Yes, we have doctrinal development. 
But this doctrinal development and dogma for the authentic Christian is going to be rooted in a real personal loving relationship. And so this fixed idea is rooted in the love of the concrete realities, persons that we're dealing with. And so the point of comparison is always going to be back to the concrete realities, the person of Jesus and Mary. The unique aspect of the Franciscan charism is that they singularly almost discovered and advocated for the cause of the Immaculate Conception. And this became the fixed idea, the Immaculate Conception, not as a, not as a vague notion, but the Immaculate Conception as the Immaculate Mediatrix, the Immaculate Mother Mediatrix, the Mother of God, the Mother of the Franciscan Order, the Mother of the Church, and the Mother of all the created children of God. And so this was their fixed idea. And their fixed idea then controlled and governed through the sanctification of the intellect, their development and argumentation and, and doctrinal development of our notions of who Mary is, especially with respect to and in defense of the Immaculate Conception. So yeah, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to lay out a general idea. The history is the locus. It's the, it's the atmosphere, the field of consciousness and freedom. But this consciousness and freedom is in development. It's in development to and from the realities of Christ and Mary. And once you have the realities of Christ and Mary, you have the reality of the church and you have the church's mission. And the, the, the focal points, even now, because we have sacrament, we have the reigning Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, <clears throat> the focal point is the concrete person of Jesus. That's to whom we pray, that's to whom we worship, or we offer worship to the Father through the Son in the Spirit, created and uncreated, meaning immaculate conception. Um, and so this notion of development then is rooted in not an abstraction, not an idea, but the fixed idea is actually upon the person of Mary, the immaculate, as immaculate. So, so bringing Newman and Colby together, then, um, the, there, there, there aren't serious incompatibilities. The incompatibilities um, stem from how Colby and Newman perceive, and Bonaventure is very close to in his Collations and Examron, exceive, uh, conceive of the approach to the critical question. Newman and Colby are closer together uh, to one another and to Bonaventure especially than they are to um, Kant on the one hand or Thomas on the other. There's a certain incompatibility. Um, Newman and Colby bring together, Colby enriching Newman in a certain way, um, at least and particularly for the mission and charism of Franciscanism within the church and the MI as an extension of really uh, the Franciscan charism and cause for the Immaculate. Um, the, it brings together into real discussion the concrete and the abstract. It reduces the abstract or traces back the abstract to the concrete in the way that our Lord himself taught. Um, we, need, we need general concepts. We need universals. We need what maybe are called exemplary ideas. They're on the level of generics. And we couldn't understand concretes if we didn't have general ideas. You know, I couldn't understand this man if I didn't have an understanding of what man is. So there has to be a general idea. But abstracts, abstractions are not real. And so our Lord himself, and Father Peter points this out very helpfully, our Lord teaches through types. But types are rooted in realities, right? So if philosophy teaches through exemplary generalities, our Lord in scripture and revelation, the economy of salvation, teaches through concrete types. And so in this sense, then, philosophy and theology, reason and faith, the analogy of being and the analogy of faith, relate in terms of the generality, the, the abstract, being reduced, at least in instances, in, 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 in accessible points of reference to the concrete. And so there is a typology and a proportion, an abstraction uh, between the types. So you have a type and an antitype. You have the serpent uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the pole in the desert, and you have Christ on the tree. That's a type and an antitype, right? And so you have to be able to make general comparisons. You have to use general concepts in order to see the connection between the types. But what, what Newman and Colby are doing is that, no, there is a real relation to the types 
because this type was created precisely to typify the ultimate realization of this type. This type is concrete and it's there's a semiotic importance revealed, but nevertheless real and really built into the type in relation to the anti-type. And so we have to learn to read types. That's how that's how we read that, that's how I read scripture is typologically, but we have to use the tools of philosophy because we can't we can't make connections without without philosophy. But theology is ultimately about the concretes. It's about persons and personal relationship. This is the point. But nevertheless, there's going to be, because persons are mysteries, there's going to be a deepening understanding. And again, it's this sp spiral-like process, this indwelling of faith and reason. We're using reason to, to, to communicate faith, but we're using faith to make stable reason, because faith gives us realities. It gives us real anchor points. Whereas reason gives us abstraction and generality. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a, a spiral-like process of development because this happens through the rise of consciousness and the development of consciousness and increased knowledge and reflection throughout history. There's always going to be more to say about Christ and Mary. And so this is the interplay then between history and freedom. History and freedom as fallen and redeemed, but as also raised and pre-redeemed in Mary and brought to perfection in Christ. And so history and freedom then bring into this aspect the realm of synergy, cooperation on every level. And so <clears throat> this fixed idea requires synergy. It requires a synergistic cooperation between created freedom, either ordered or disordered, and uncreated freedom. What he's absolutely elected and what he has providentially foreseen. And then finally, uh, a reduction to um, persons and not abstractions. Now, finally, we get to the last page. <clears throat> so we get to the, how does this relate to the two pages of history? Well, we've already discussed the notion of the fixed idea, the interplay between philosophy and theology, faith and reason. And then finally, the, the priority in the Franciscan school of the fixed idea of, of, the, of the Immaculate Conception as the cause. Well, clearly the Franciscan order had charismatic roots. And this, this what I mean is that a, a certain un, unique presencing and influence of the Holy Spirit on, on the per, upon the person of St. Francis. St. Francis was a contemplative. He flew with the eagles where we crawl like worms on the ground. Um, there was a charismatic initiation or orientation. And this, this should tell you something. It's that we're dealing with concrete persons here in real relations through the Spirit to our Lord and Our Lady. These, they, these are, you're talking about realities here. So Francis himself is a theological reality because he's a person dealing with persons. And out of this relationship, Christ calls him to rebuild my church, and Mary becomes the advocate. And second minister general, or first minister general, I can't remember exactly how it was said, of the Franciscan order. And this then, this charismatic root, and this positing of a relation and influence, also touches upon this question of de judicatio judgment. It's the judgment of the saint that is the catalyst for doctrinal development. It's, it's not ultimately philosophical concepts or a working out of, you know, what must be necessary conclusions. It's the judgment of a saint being taught internally and externally by the magisterium in real relation, be the intellect becoming sanctified and achieving sanctity. There's judgments in relation to what, what is the case because there's a deepening of one's understanding based upon the intensification of that relationship. And so Francis was fully plugged into the influence, fully receptive to, to the influence of Jesus and Mary, and then fully plugged into the teaching, under receptive of the teaching of Christ and Mary. So he would have insight, you know, the stupendous insights is, there is none similar to you among women, um, that, that Mary was spouse of the Holy Spirit. All of these are stated charismatically and in a mystical kind of popular sense, but they're genuine insights based upon contemplative uh, or infused contemplation. You know, what I'm saying is the charismatic roots, the working of the spirit in synergy with a faithful follower of Christ. And that working, that reality is something that God ordains. You know, Francis arise, arrived on the scene at a certain time. 
So this is all part of God's providence for the, 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 the increase and glorification of his kingdom. And so you have the teaching of Christ and Mary. Well, what you have for St. Bonaventure getting back, you have, remember, the three modes of theology we, sp we spoke about. You need all three, and they live in a, in, a, in a kind of continual relationship, just like memory, intellect, and will are always operating in the one person in a relation, just like hope, faith, and charity are always operating together. You distinguish them in order to come to clearer knowledge, but you have to realize they're already always operational, just like the three modes of theology. You have the symbolic, you know, you have the authoritative creedal statements, you have the academic as the second mode, and you have the contemplative as the third mode. Well, all of these things need to be operating together. And from within that distinction, you can distinguish further between the teaching of Christ. Remember, in 1 John, you have no need of a teacher for, you know, uh, Christ himself is your teacher. Well, yes, that's true. Christ is the teacher, and Mary is the teacher, both from within the heart of the believer, in that relation of faith and charity that that believer has to Christ and Mary, and also from without, authoritative. So the from within is charismatic, and from without is authoritative and hierarchical. And so this corresponds roughly the without to the symbolic and the charismatic to the contemplative. And the ac academic is dealing with both, but ultimately for the sake of the contemplative. But the charismatic can never be separated from the authoritative or the institutional. And we can, we can, we can talk and, and, and make arguments for that, but I mean, this is the point. So there's, there's a from within, and this is the charismatic aspect of doctrinal development and the arising of new of, of new movements well the charismatic can be deceived in itself or deceiving and so you need the authoritative hierarchical aspect as well there's a there's a balance and ultimately the authoritative hierarchical mode is the mode of preserving unity juridically and sacramentally because why well they possess apostolic succession and they administer the sacraments and preserve the sacraments and the teaching and so the charismatic must give way to the authoritative, but the authoritative, if it's wise, will listen to the charismatic and recognize the new movements of the spirit. And this goes back to then doctrinal development, fixed idea, the concrete and the abstract, and the relationship and development of history. So <clears throat> with respect to the two pages then, the first page were, were rooted in contemplation of the mystery of Mary and the Immaculate Conception and the Incarnation. And this became the cause. The first page is the articulation in the academic mode, but it's already rooted in the charismatic experience of Christ, the charismatic experience of St. Bonaventure and Blessed Duns Scotus within the institutional church. It's articulating and defending, making, um, making that faith, that, that what is to believe intelligible. So everybody can understand it without misunderstanding. We don't want to say, uh, you know, Mary is God or Mary isn't saved by Jesus, that sort of thing. These are the kinds of objections. And so the Franciscan mission was to say, no, this, this mission, this reality of Immaculate Conception doesn't fall afoul of dogma. In fact, it's, it's most intimately rooted to dogma because it's about the truth of the person of who Mary is. So this is the first page. There's a development here based upon a relationship and then a fixed idea and a development and reflection upon that person in relation and the ideas about that person. And then the second page is the incorporation. So the two pages, there's still development. So, but you move from the intellectual component to the, the emphasizing the intellectual without denying the symbolic or the contemplative to an emphasis on realizing the contemplative within the context of the symbolic and the academic. So the first page, according to St. Maximilian, is we arrive at the definition. The second page, now that we've got the definition, what do we do with it? Well, this is perfectly Bonaventurian and Scotistic. Understanding is for the sake of love. Knowledge is for the sake of wisdom. Knowledge is, wisdom is knowledge passing into affection. Knowledge, theology is ut boni fiamis, in order that we may be good. Blessed John Duns Scotus says that theology is ultimately a practical di a discipline. Why? So that we can love God and neighbor. So once we have the, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, well, what are we going to do about it? This is essentially what St. Maximilian is saying here. And so, yes, we emphasize the, the academic, the proper, 
in order to arrive at the, the definition, authoritative ratification and um, recognition of the Immaculate Conception. But now that we've got this, well, what are we going to do about it? What are the implications? Again, we've talked, well, it's, it's all about what everything is implied about Mary. So we've got to incorporate this, but we do it under the banner of the Immaculate Conception. Why? Because the Immaculate Conception is the proto-mystery. It's the primordial mystery of, of Mary. She's immaculate in order to be conceived. She's uniquely, that's her own grace, is immaculate. But she's immaculate in order to bring forth the God-man. And so <clears throat> to kind of wrap this up, I think that's it. Yep. Um, what he posits then is already accepting the activity of Mary at every stage in her unique relation to Jesus in bringing forth head and members. Well, she's going to continually be active in bringing forth Christ in the members and in the body. And so this is where total consecration comes in. Total consecration is a recognition that Mary is unique. She stands at the forefront, as well as above, as well as within the church. She's in a unique relation to the Trinity and to the Son. She's of, a, of an order higher than ourselves, while nevertheless being the perfection of ourselves in that very hierarchized order. Um, and so she has an active role. And that active role is based upon a perfect identity of, of will with, with God as manifest through the Holy Spirit. Mary is perfectly open and in conformity from the beginning of her existence with the will of the Spirit. That's why she can be called the created Immaculate Conception. So as created Immaculate Conception and as a real person, she becomes the fixed idea. And so in, in, in recognizing that she is the concrete instantiation of the perfection of created personhood, we seek to consecrate ourselves to her because she knows the will of God better than we do. And so as, and she is our mother. And so it's, it's a matter of common sense at that point to say, yes, I consecrate myself to you. Use me because you're still a living person engaged in influencing the course of history and the church through history. I make this act of consecration to you because why? You know better and you will, will conform my will to the will of the Father in the Spirit or through the Spirit, more in the Spirit, more effectively than I could uh, do this apart from you. Just as the incarnation and the birth of the of, of, of Christ, head and members, was essentially, not necessarily, but nevertheless essentially through Mary, so also is our sanctification, whether we recognize it or not, and our giving birth to Christ in our own lives, essentially through Mary. Total consecration is a conscious psychological act after we're already reborn in Christ, recognizing the truth of the matter. It's it's a it's 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 a it's a kind of charismatic parallel to the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Bat baptism in confirmation, especially baptism, make you a Christian in first act. It constitutes you as a Christian. Confirmation in the Latin tradition is a recognizing that there's a certain perfection and completion to the sacrament of baptism and a personal ratification that now I'm a soldier of Christ. Well, total consecration is the personal aspect, the charismatic, not the institutional, um, not the academic ratification of the same reality, such that I know I don't just speak in terms of the habits of faith or the reality of faith in general, the life of faith in general. No, I speak about the acts of faith. Not just the habit, but the actual activity. And so consecration to Mary is saying, in my activity, in octu secundo, misspelled that, um, I need to be consecrated to you not such that my will will be conformed in general, but also in the concrete to the will of the Father. Because why? Because all of this, and Mary is now pivotal, as with our Lord, to the, the completion or recognition of this itinerarium or journey of the mind into God. Um, <clears throat> so that that's basically the two pages of, of Franciscan history and how they relate to the critical question to development of doctrine and the fixed idea and um, the charismatic and uh, 
institutional and academic aspects. Uh, I'll open it up for questions. I don't know what kind of time we have here. Uh, 927. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes, I'm sure. So please uh, ask questions. If things aren't clear, you know, raise issues. Oh, some chats. So oh, 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 I met, <laughs> I put the documents you mentioned there. Um, oh, cool, and, thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure. One question until now. Would be, one question would be, oh, and to explain the other, the other one, I was poking fun at Fra Joseph Pio for the pronunciation of soul. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, my, my, my in-laws lived in Seoul for almost, I guess, almost 15 years. So they, they'd probably know better than I about that. <laughs> well, my English um, is distracted. It's pretty good. You would have to always be excusing my French. <laughs> Um, one, oh, go ahead. One question would be, we've talked about this in the past, but br this brings in the typological structure of reality. As you mentioned to me once, that metaphysics can be seen as in this sort of theological metaphysics mm -hmm. as seeing the structure of created reality as based in the... Um, it was, it was sort of based in this typological structure. I don't know if you what you think about sort of the uh, the interest online of people like Jonathan Peugeot with this whole symbolic thinking. If this is sort of a rebirth of this sensitivity, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think it is. I, I think I think Bono, I think well, Jonathan Peugeot is uh, he he is he's a Canadian convert. I think he's Roman Catholic historically, but he's a convert to Orthodoxy. And so orthodoxy uh, emphasizes, orthodoxy, I suppose, never had a fully robust Aristotelian movement, and they never had a fully robust Kantian or Cartesian movement. Now, that's not to say that everything's great in orthodoxy, because a lot of their theology and conceptual apparatus is rather primitive. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, the 17th century Thomists and Franciscans are are light years beyond anybody talking to now they're talking now they're they're just simply beyond us we can't even begin to do theology like they did theology so we are more primitive than they are and theologically speaking but probably more advanced conceptually speaking than orthodox but what orthodox have never forgotten and this is this is this is because of their emphasis on icon and the essence energies distinction polymus but also saint maximilian saint maximus confessor and his logi, his logos, metaphysics and epistemology. And what, what I want to say is that that's, that's right. I think there's something fundamentally right about this. And this is also what Bonaventure believed. And to, to long story short, Bonaventure following Augustine, but also following the pseudo Dionysius, made a very clear distinction between Neoplatonic exemplarism and Christian exemplarism. Christian exemplarism is not Neoplatonic exemplarism. Why? Because persons and freedom and love are the primary factors, not necessity, okay? <clears throat> but nevertheless, all creation has this what's called semiotic. Like I think from the Greek word semion for sign, that's a general way of saying that all creation is ultimately typological, why? Because creation in the first instance, as St. Maximus Confessor would say, as the icons try to show forth, all creation is first a sign of God, God's own mind, his creative will, even before, this is more fundamental to its ontological constitution than its own nature. You know, St. Bonaventure in, I think, question, it's in question two or three of the, of the disputed questions on the mystery of Christ will say that there's reality in the mind, there's reality in, in the thing, and there's reality in the eternal art. And he would say ultimately that the reality in the eternal art is more expressive 
and thus more true than even the expressed reality in creation. And so the, the, the ultimate reality then, the ultimate foundation, I guess, of created reality is that we're all first signs of God, signs of God's knowledge, God's love, ultimately. And that's our purpose. And then he constitutes us or builds us up as natures in relation, in a world with a history and an order, that sort of thing. And so that's, that's, that's St. Bonaventure and, and St. Maximus Confessor are exactly right. And what you have in Scotus, many people take Scotus as reducing things to just abstractions. No, I, I think Father Peter explodes this in all of his work. And that's why we're working on getting it published. As he frames Dun Scotus properly in terms of the priority of person and the priority in the economy of the incarnation. And everything flows from this. The reason why, according to Father Peter, and I think he's right, he's on it, he's a deep insight, is we have to remember generally that Scotus was a theologian first. He was a lover of our Lord and our Lady. He was the one who advocated the Immaculate Conception. He was the one who advocated the absolute primacy. He was the one who advocated and gave the longest treatise on the mystery of the Eucharist in all of medieval philosophy, the most profound treatise. He's the one who advocated, who went against, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, brothers, uh, how do you say, Philippe Le Bel? How do you say? Philippe Le Bel. Philippe Le Bel. Uh, he was the one who said, no, we're not gonna do this. I'm with the church, with the with the Pope. Um, so so Scotus was was not an ab, a person to reduce to rationalism to abstractions um he was invested in concrete realities he was obsessed with our lord and our lady and so when he developed his philosophical tools just like saint maximus just like saint bonaventure and here's a hint if you read saint bonaventure why he's so difficult in certain ways is because his philosophical categories his terms are coming from scripture perhaps more so than any other western writer after after the great Latin fathers, this is why he's difficult. You've got to read the Vulgate to get to get uh, to get Bonaventure, at least in part, not just Aristotle. Um, so Scotus formulates his notion of you know university of being. What is university of being? Well, he does it precisely so we can talk about God, so he can say God can reveal Himself to us. But what is philos what is university of being? It's one concept, right, in two disjunctive modes. One concept that to which essay is not contradictory. How does, it, how does it instantiate itself? Or in what way must it instantiate itself? Either in an infinite mode or in a finite mode. Well, what's the, what, is the, what is the primordial, not the highest, not the central, but the primordial doctrine of Christian faith? The hypostatic union, right? Bonaventure calls it the mo most mysterious. It's more mysterious than the Trinity, he says, in trying to explain. But what is the hypostatic union? What does it mirror? It's an analogy of proportion to the univocal concept of being. One person in two natures. One person, irreducible. Fontal source in two natures. Divine, human. And so disjunctive transcendentals, formal distinction, all of these philosophical innovations of Scotus are there to allow us to talk about the realities of the Trinity, the incarnation, the sacraments. And so when people say he's a rationalist i just say you don't know what you're talking about you just don't even if you're even if you're chaired and tenured at a great university father peter knows better than you um so uh i don't, I don't know what i'm saying anymore i've forgotten what the question was <laughs> something about philippe labella um for me it so, uh, this Jonathan, how you Hi, Joe. Uh, he, he said that uh, the, the symbolic world in some ways with the narration could reach the real world. So the two worlds uh, put it together. And I was asking myself because I, I, I've done a few works on uh, this, uh, the snake, then the, the, the woman that will crush, crush a snake, that's it? Yes. So the, the symbolic world of, of uh, Saint Maximilian Kolbe, uh, we could say it. So it has a very deep um, roots in the in the, in the in the story of the church, but even in the the Franciscan theology. And it's something much more real that we could even think about it, because yeah. it's it's very it's very concrete. 
for him, it was very concrete. For us, it's something very symbolical. But maybe it, we have some some points to understand on this because the the head of the the head of the the snake is the, the devil, but the body of the snake are the heresies heresies. So yeah, in some ways, the impact of Mary and the story is even on destructing these heresies and finding a way of doing it. I mean something concrete yeah yeah i think i think that's the i think that's the key point that uh we must never forget is that um the realities of of christ and mary in sacrament and in influence um <clears throat> and who are accessible through praise and invocation they're more real than any general philosophical concept and so we always have to be rooted in this, this ecstatic movement, if not in success, but this ecstatic movement towards the other. You know, I've got all my ideas in my head. I could just sit and talk to an empty room. But here I'm talking to you guys. Why? Because I, I'm, I'm inv invoking, I'm, I'm pleading. And you are pleading back to come into relation between persons because we want to share and enjoy the good together. We want to come to a deeper understanding. And I, th I think that's the importance. Theology is not about ideas, but ideas are there to, as, as St. John Henry Newman says, <clears throat> without theology, um, dogma becomes vulnerable to attack, right? But without dogma, <laughs> and dogma ultimately being Jesus and Mary, and the Trinity, without dogma, theology is just a joke. It's all an invention. You know, it, the theology is not an end in itself. That's the whole point. This is why the academic mode, St. Bonaventure says, if you just engage in theology, you are setting yourself up for destruction. Idle curiosity will destroy you. Theology has to be an ascetical endeavor. Why? Because we're seeking not just to know, but to know in order to love the sources, the persons who call us into being and call us into glory. And so we've, caught, we've got to constantly be praying. Theology becomes a prayer in order that we have acquired and infused contemplation, which is just simply what, 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 what St. Francis experienced in the fullness in his transitus. But what, is our Lord, what does our Lord speak of in, what is it, Matthew 17? And he talks with, uh, he brings Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he talks with Moses and Elijah about his what? His, ex, his, his exodus. In the Latin Vulgate, it's exchesus. But exchesus is the same term that Bonaventure uses, again, biblical categories coming into play. Bonaventure uses to describe moving into that realm of mystical contemplation. It's a kind of dying to self. It's not self-indulgence. It's not curiosity. It's a dying to self in order to be brought into new life. In relationship in the trinity no one has seen god and lived right however you take that that's literally true <laughs> however you interpret that that's literally true so you have to die and jesus when he speaks of his ex Jesus, he's talking about his death and his resurrection his return to the father when bonaventure speaks of ex Jesus, it's the same term and he's talking about a, a, a transfigurative a, a death and transfigurative aspect not just through baptism, that's the foundation, that's essential, but in our daily activity in life, there's always an invocation. And this is why St. Maximilian founded the, the MI, is that there can be a holy competition amongst all of us for sanctity. Why? Because we love one another and we love Mary, because God loved Mary. And so we recognize not just her as an idea in the past, but as this active presence. This is why she's assumed into heaven. You know, Jesus was assumed too, he ascended. You think he's not, nothing's going on here? He's not doing anything in the economy anymore? He's not reigning? He's not, well, you, no, that's not true. Neither is Mary. Why would she be, ass, uh, uh, why would she be assumed if she's just going to go up there and hang out? You know, she doesn't care about her offspring. She doesn't care about all the adopted sons she has. You know, if we can say, if we can say that the father is the father of Jesus and Mary's the mother of Jesus and we're adopted sons of the father, we're, we're all adopted sons of Mary too. And there is no mother that's going to just leave if she can help it. But she's raised to newness and fullness of life bodily. So she's, she's more present to us 
in her um, transcendence and assumption than she was in history because she's been quasi quasi sacramentalized she's in a she's in a vantage point where now she can have universal influence and so we need to we, we and we 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 arrive or accept this influence primarily through prayer and invocation humility this is why again total consecration is so important because it's only by being totally consecrated to mary as mary was to the father through the spirit that we could bring forth christ individually and then the church can ultimately reach its historical um, culmination or fulfillment <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just i'm just talking so any any other questions i think we should probably get going since we've been going for a while and we have uh vest oh yeah sorry the um i would just say that the both fra joseph pio and i were referring to that interview there's also through his podcast there's an audio only version between jonathan peugeot and jordan peterson where they get into this whole idea of the narrative and the concrete touching and it's yeah you can tell definitely that peterson's experience has it's it's interesting because he's talking about like that um, it, the possibility of this narrative, like the, sim, the symbol of Christ that everything points towards, it, like that breaking into historical reality. He says like, I, I don't know what you do if that is, if that's wow. true. Yeah, if, if that's true, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's amazing, like here's this agnostic psychology professor who the very concept of Christ actually being a real person yeah. puts him into tears and then you know we like attend lectures He's on gone. theosis and then he won <laughs> I, well yeah right you're absolutely right so but it should, it should so yeah. yeah well you need to get him you need to get him you're the guy to do it you need to get him some uh some good digestible texts of father peter and semiotic metaphysics and typology because he's got to get out of he's got to get out of Jung and get back into uh, the metaphysics of Saint Maximus or Saint Bonaventure. I and think this will, would, this will this will connect connect a lot of the dots. I think that would be. I mean, I don't know how I, I've been trying to see if I could connect them with him personally. That'd be good, but um, yeah, it's breaking through of that i think even the mystics like john of the cross was talking about the purification of the intellect and how you have to let go the natural mode of the intellect and walk by faith i think that's i mean that's right where he he needs because he's trying to put everything through this jungian lens mm -hmm. and it's not going to uh i mean it just you can't break out of that but then the second thing too is there's no grace in that and so it's like, well, what if God walked among us? I mean, then it, if you face that without grace, and especially also if you face that without the mediation of Our Lady, who I'm thinking of, you know, the, the poem of Hopkins, where he talks about how, you know, it's like Christ is the sun and Mary is the atmosphere. And without the atmosphere, the earth would just be a charred rock like Mercury. That's right. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see, to listen to their discussion, but um, it's at a time it's like just that, that need to go over that hump to, to ask for grace. And it was interesting because Jonathan Bajot was, Jordan Peterson is always saying, you know, I, I act like God exists. You believe God exists? I act like God exists. And something he kept hammering on was, you know, in a very sort of, tactical and tactful way because jordan peterson is still very much in recovery from his uh from his health crisis that um the first acting like god exists is first worship and it's not following you know being responsible um so anyways we should probably uh call it a night uh, or, or a morning. <laughs> or a morning.
<laughs> That's right. Well, um, I will I will look today and see. We're gonna we're gonna take bigger steps because Father Peter recapitulates a lot of the material and goes into greater depth. But I think some you know these initial nine or so lectures. I don't know what more I'm gonna say about some of these matters apart from responding to specific questions. So I think I will I will look at the rest of the text going forward and see if I can pick some other uh, highlights and maybe we'll make faster progress. Uh, we may not even need to take 30 weeks we could or 30 lectures we can take 20. I don't know uh, how we'll see how it goes. I mean unless unless there's more yeah. question. Yeah. If we did want to ask more questions I do just I did just receive permission to keep going if we want to. <laughs> I, I, I sent a message asking, can we keep going? And I just got a, a positive response, but. Okay, well, we, sure. Um, I, I, I have, I probably, I, you know, you probably should go pray because I only have probably 10 minutes. And so is it, is it worth it? Yeah. It's a bit of me to go. So we'll. Well, yeah, would one of the deacons be able to uh, finish us off? Okay. But, but not the anointing, not, not an anointing, just, just a blessing. You can't, if we're, okay. if we're reaching our end, we you can't do that until you're a priest. Oh, no. I'm sorry, finish us off is in like, you know, <laughs> how do you say it? It's the cold, the, the blow of grace. Um, here, sorry. Here, it's, this is there. becoming painful. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just praying and that's it. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be the Amen. So that the Holy Spirit could bless everybody and give us strength and illumination for this work. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great week and great Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. As for you.